please, uh, Saeed will join us. Uh, I guess so, yes. Okay. Okay. Let's start, I guess. So, um, uh, good evening, dear friends, dear colleagues. I'm so happy to introduce uh, uh, our colleague and friend, Justin Sears, to talk to you this, uh, this evening in Morocco about uh, an issue, a controversial issue till now about the, the, the paradigm or the anti-paradigm of inhitat of decline. I'm also uh, very happy to... Uh, to be among other uh, colleagues and friends from Tunisia, Oxford, Tetuan, and others. Uh, what I can say as introduction is that the period between 1198 and 1789 is still for many historians uh, of the Middle East, a period of darkness and uh, intellectual decline the occupation of Baghdad by the Mongols marks the beginnings of this era politically. The point of no return has been reached. That's the... So Ibn Rushd's death, as a, a Rushdian uh, scholar, Ibn Rushd's death was a turning point for European as well as for Islamic intellectual history. Ibn Rushd becomes the symbol of the rise of uh, European culture. He's falling into uh, oblivion marks the downfall of Islamic culture. Tilman Najil, for, for example, a great uh, scholar in his study on Islamic theology, dated the downfall of Islamic rationalism even earlier than the death of Ibn Rushd. According to him, Islamic rationalism comes to its end in the work of Al Juwaini, Abu Al Ma'ali Al Juwaini. So uh, there is, I mean, there is a dominated. Uh, a narrative concerning uh, the history of uh, uh, Islamic uh, civilization. Uh, what uh, Justin Stearns and others, Khalid Rwayhev and others, try to do is to revisit this uh, 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 paradigm or this narrative uh, based mainly on uh, documents. There are many things already did, already done concerning the, I mean, the, the, the Middle East and the, the other, the, the other, I mean, parts of the Muslim world. But about this side of the Muslim world, I mean, we are, we still uh, need more uh, studies and more, I mean, uh, documents that that can help to uh, let's say, uh, let's say, to give an counter example of what we have already. I mean. Uh, uh, known about this uh, decline uh, period or the decline uh, paradigm. Um, uh, I will introduce another friend that, okay. Sorry to, there is another friend that is waiting. Okay. So, uh, Justin Stearns, I mean, our uh, uh, speaker today will talk about the revealed sciences towards a new history of the natural sciences in pre-modern in pre-modern pre Moroccan uh, history. Justin Stearns received his BA in English and History from Dartmouth College in 1998, and his PhD from in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University in 2007. He is currently associate professor uh, of uh, Arab Crossroads Studies at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Uh, his research interests uh, focus on the intersection of law, uh, sciences, and theology in the pre-modern Muslim Middle East in North Africa. His first book, I mean, was Infectious, uh, Infectious Idea. I don't know if 
it is the i mean i have to to uh, some promotion okay uh, um Infectious uh, idea, contagion in pre-modern Islamic and Christian thought in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, so it's published by uh, it is published by John Hopkins University Press in 2011. His book on the social status of of the natural uh, in early uh, natural sciences in early modern Morocco revealed sciences the natural sciences in Islam in in, in early modern Morocco was published in 2020 or in 2021. And the first volume of his edition and translation of Lahsan uh, al Yusi, a very, very interesting edition and translation, Al Muhadarat or Discourses. Uh, I, mean, I mean, okay. And then uh, appeared with the Library of Arabic Literature in uh, 2020. Uh, okay, I mean, I will talk now in Arabic for a while. And then I will introduce you uh, there, uh, Justin. I, I mean, before that, I, I should say thank you so much for accepting our invitation to talk to our, I mean, uh, colleagues and uh, friends here in Morocco and in and elsewhere. مساء الخير سيداتي سادتي أنا سعيد جدا اليوم بتقديمي أحد أبرز الباحثين في المجال في مجال التأريخ للأفكار العلمية وعلم الكلام والعلوم الطبيعية في في المغرب جاستن ستيرنز أستاذ مشارك أو ما كما نسميه في المغرب أستاذ مؤهل يعني في جامعة نيويورك بأبو ظبي ما يمكنني أن أقول كمقدمة لهذه المحاضرة وهو أنه قد ساد اعتقاد بين الدارسين أنه بعد وفاة الفيلسوف الأندلسي المغربي أبو الوليد بعد وفاة الفيلسوف الأندلسي أبو الوليد ابن رشد عام 1198 ميلادية 595 هجرية و ايضا مع سقوط بغداد تحت في حكم تحت حكم المغول دخل العالم الاسلامي عموما في حاله سبات في حاله ظلام في حاله في عصر ظلام امتد الى حدود غزو نابليون بونابرت لمصر في عام ربما في عام 1789 بالضبط وكانه وكان العالم الاسلامي غادر العقلانيه بموت ابن رشد واستفاق على عقلانيه الغرب في مع على يد نابليون بونابرت إذا دخل العالم الإسلامي فترة انحطاط شديدة جدا وتوقف العالم الإسلامي عن الأنشطة لم يعد هنالك علوم إلى آخره كل هذه كل هذه الأفكار سادت لزمن معين وهي الآن تسمى بباراديغم أو بارادايم الانحطاط أو سردية الانحطاط جاستن ستيرنز إلى جانب دارسين آخرين يمكن أن أذكر مثلا خالد رويهب من جامعة هارفارد يحاولون مراجعة هذه الأحكام السائدة بين الدارسين ب يعني بالاعتماد على الوثائق الأساسية التي تكشف عن الحركية أو الدينامية العلمية التي كانت سائدة في في هذا العصر طبعا أغلب الدارسين يعني يمكن يلاحظون أن هنالك نوعا من اللا توازن بين الاهتمام بالدراسات في المشرق والاهتمامات بالاهتمام بالدراسات بما يحصل في المغرب أهمية في نظر الشخصي يعني في تقدير الشخصي أهمية ما يقوم به جاستن ستيرنز خالد رويه كيتلين أولسون وغيرهم تكمن في أنهم يركزون على ما يحصل في المغرب الذي يعتبر طرفا هامشيا على يعني بقياس الى العالم الاسلامي المحاضره اليوم يعني عنوانها هو ريفيلد ساينسز تووردز ا نيو هيستوري اوف ناتشورال ساينسز ان بروميدون مروكو ستمس المحاضره اساسا كتاب جاستن ستيرنز الاخير الذي هو بعنوان ريفيلد ساينسز ناتشورال ساينسز ان الاسلام ان اورلي مودرن مروكو لم احب ان اترجم هذا العنوان الافضل لانه يعني يعني صدر حديثا جدا ساعطي كلمه للاستاذ والزميل والصديق جاستن ستيرنز ليتحدث وبعد ذلك سي يعني ساعطي الكلمه للاصدقاء ضيوف كاتلين اولسون مقداد يونس سعيد 
في حالة ما رغبوا في التعليق على هذه المحاضرة uh, شكرا لمتابعتكم So uh, Justin uh, the, the floor is yours please uh, go ahead ألف شكر يا فؤاد من البداية أريد أن أشكر فؤاد ولهذا يمكنني أن أتحدث إليكم يعني عن هذا الموضوع وكما قلت قبل قليل لفؤاد أنا أتذر لأنني سأتكلم إليكم يعني بإنجليزي وليس بالعربي And so the rest of this you're going to get largely in English although I'm happy at the end to come back and to answer questions in, uh, in Arabic or English or French or Spanish or, or what have you um, other other languages so let's see if I can share my screen and um, here we go okay okay so can everyone see that yes can I get a thumbs up yes okay yes. so good so I want to, again, to thank Fouad for the chance to present this to you. It's such a pleasure to be able to speak about this subject to an audience that is interested in the subject, but also specifically has a background in, in Morocco and understands the, 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 the importance of the history of, of Morocco itself. What I hope to do tonight is to, is to speak for probably about 45 minutes about in, in three different parts. Um, about the subject of how we might write a history of the natural sciences in the pre-modern period in, in Morocco. And what I intend to do is to start out by going right into the middle of things and giving you my argument, and then following that to consider some of the materials in which I based my book, and at the end to pull back and to address some of the larger uh, historiographical framing issues um, that are relevant. Here. So, what is the argument? The argument is going to start with the lives of three men. The first of them is a fellow by the name of Al Neriti, whom you can see here, who, and, and the geography is, a little, is important for the first point I want to make here, was born in Marrakesh, moved south uh, to Merit, which is a small village um, south of the Atlas, then studied in Tarodant, Fez, and in uh, Dilet the Zawiya and the Let, and then ended up being um, Imam of a mosque in Marrakesh. And the things that he spent his time writing about included, as you can see here, astronomy, alchemy, letterism, and a, a wonderful treatise against sorcery that was at the, uh, the picture from the, the title page I gave you, was taken from that. The second one is Lahsan al as is, is, uh, Fouad also mentioned, a figure who has occupied me a lot in the last decade. And he was, as we know, born uh, near Sefru, studied in Tamgrut, in uh, Marrakesh, Dilet, and Fez, Tatwan, and went to Mecca very briefly before his death and then returned. And he wrote, as we know, on um, uh, logic, epistemology, theology, literature, law, a wide variety of things. The third is a Salahiya Dara'i, probably the least known of these three, who was born near Tamgrut, a small oasis, Laqtawa, studied in Sijamasa in Fez, and then returned and, and died near Tamgrut. And he wrote on medicine, astronomy, and letterism. So these are just three biographies, very brief biographies. Um, and although al Dara'i dies um, in 1731 here, he's actually born before al Yusi. He lives a very long life. Um, and, and they give us a sense of how people in the 17th century, how Moroccan scholars who were influential and at the center of institutions of learning, engage with the natural sciences. To give you another sense, here we have a map. Let's start off with Al-Meriti. He's born near Marrakesh, moves down. As you can see, Merit is a village uh, south of Tiznit, goes north to Tarundant, studies in Fez, spends a lot of time in Dilet, where he is actually al yusis teacher. And in, uh, in Ijaza that he gives al yusi we see that he teaches al yusi um, the, the natural sciences, astronomy, which al meriti is chiefly known for, and most of his manuscripts in Moroccan libraries today uh, relate to his work on astronomy. Um, and then before he returns to, to Marrakesh, where he's uh, an imam and he dies of the plague in, in 1678. Al-Yusi is born near Sefru, studies in Marrakesh, Terudant, Sejermasa, Tamgrut, before spending the middle third of his life in Dilet, where he writes most of his works and where he acquires most of his knowledge. After the rising Alawite dynasty raises the Dilet Zawiya, he travels in Fez, Tetuan, Marrakesh, does uh, on Hajj and returns and dies near Sefru. 
And if you're a uh, Salahi al Dara'i, is born south of Tamgrud, studies in Fez, Sijr Masa, before returning to Tamgrud. So a couple of things become clear here, as you can see the constellation of these arrows. First of all, all of these men um, lived active lives at different centers of learning in the Moroccan landscape, that easily half of these centers of learning were chiefly rural. Some of them, such as the Dile Zawiya, which was extraordinarily prominent in the 17th century, are now gone, no longer exist. Others, such as Tamgrut or even Taradant, um, and, and there's other Zawiyas on here that are relevant, which I'll come to, such as the Hamziya Ayashiya Lodge and the High Atlas, um, are now marginal in the general uh, landscape of, of Moroccan intellectual life. Um, and so they may easily be forgotten. So we have here a landscape of learning which with the rural, the rural nature of which bears emphasizing at the outset. What I hope to argue, um, at least to have you entertain the possibility of in the following is this, that the rational, the philosophical sciences in the 17th century specifically, but in the early modern period more broadly, played an important role in intellectual life in Morocco during this period. And it was not perhaps central, but the interest in these particular sciences has rarely been central to any society. It is almost always an elite minority concern. But in this case, it was, it was important and it was accepted. If we judge by the paradigms that we have today, and I'll be using the word paradigm quite a bit as we'll come to see it when I talk about Thomas Kuhn, there were few advances uh, in any of these sciences during this period with the possible exception of logic. In medicine, astronomy, mathematics, and logic were integral during this time period to the practice of Islamic jurisprudence. In, and they were all studied in both urban and rural centers throughout Morocco during this time period. And I have in my book in an appendix a list of approximately 125 works in the natural sciences that were written in Morocco during what I see as the long 17th uh, 17th century, so they were not only read, but there were also fields to which were people contributed. They were practiced during this time alongside alchemy, astro astrology, letrism, and other occult sciences, which were seen as equally as rational and also were classified as natural sciences in the same way as would say um, medicine um, or as um, astrology and sometimes astronomy, depending on how you calculate it. To understand the fact that these sciences were practiced, were studied, were written in, and were seen as socially valuable, we can get a much better sense of their social importance and their prominence within in these, these rural and urban institutions if we for a moment aban abandon notions of uh, sort of a classical teleology of a history of science, right? Because there's a reason that Fawad outlined this narrative of decline in his opening remarks, and I will come to that at the end. But let me just briefly invoke the, um, the theories of the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, um, when he talks about the incommensurability of different scientific paradigms, that it, we can consider that they were practicing a form of natural science which today, from within our perspective, our collective, I use R because I believe it's a paradigm that's shared both in the Arab world, the Muslim world, and in, in Europe and the United States, from the perspective of modern science, much of what they did, what they pursued, would not be seen as terribly interesting, right? Which helps explain the whole inhitat or decline narrative that Fawad alluded to. And I'll just highlight that there. If we can set that aside for a second, we'll understand precisely how dynamic um, their engagement with these sciences was. So those are the conclusions. Now, let's take a look at the evidence. Where, where do we find the natural sciences when we look at the material and the sources from this time? Here, and Fouad was doing such a wonderful job of, of, as, as a potential literary agent for me that I have to, to thank him for putting all three of my, my books up in front of the screen. But here's another chance for me to plug my own work. This is the book that just came out uh, this past summer that I am now largely talking about uh, today in today's lecture. So a few things, just to remind you, what was Morocco in the 17th century, right? What's the political context at the time period? So we find that in the 16th century, the Saidi dynasty, uh, rising from Sijamasa and then coming to control 
uh, the central urban areas in Morocco, revivifies the urban institutions of, of learning, the madrasa, the, uh, the madaris, and also it's underneath, underneath the Saidis as they come to, to unify Morocco under a Sharifian legitimacy, right? Uh, the prior dynasties immediately before this had all been Amazir, or um, sometimes called Berber dynasties, if you go back to the Amoravids, the Almohads, and the, and the Marinids. And in, they create a new form of, of political legitimacy, and they also truly emphasize the importance of, the, of, of study, of learning, and of the sciences in general. And here I rely still on the classic works of Muhammad Haji, one of many Moroccan scholars who's really set the foundation for my, my own work. The Saidi dynasty hits its uh, kind of its, its apogee, perhaps, with the rule of Ahmed al-Mansur, its last major ruler. There's a, a, a sort of a, a very dramatic defeat of the European powers in 1578. Ahmed al-Mansur, after that, orders the conquest of West Africa and, and of, of Timbuktu, and uniting West and North Africa in closer economic and intellectual ties before he passes away in 1603 due to the plague. And the Saidi dynasty then loses its, its control over all of Morocco, though it remains relevant for some time. It is during the central period, after the fall, the collapse of the Saidi dynasty, and before the rise of the Alawite dynasty in 1668, um, and its gradual consolidation under Moulay Ismail of, the, of Morocco as a whole, that the events that I look at in, in this book take place. So it's, it's a, a period of political chaos for the most part, where some of these rural uh, Sufi lodges, these Zawaya, such as the Dilat Lodge, be, uh, assume uh, central importance. And that brings us to the intellectual context. So we're looking at a time period here where we have a, an abundance of urban and rural intellectual centers in Morocco, and where under the Saidis, we had an infrastructure of learning and of the value of, of the transmission of knowledge had been put into place that continued after their downfall into these rural areas. And it bears noting just briefly that these rural Zawaya were also able to maintain themselves outside of the direct kind of sponsorship from urban rulers. So they had their own economic basis. The part of the conquest of Timbuktu was that it shifted the trade routes a little bit west of Sijil Masa to the, uh, the valley where we now have um, uh, the Nasiriya Laj and Tamgrut, and this trade of gold and of slaves um, along the Sahara also gave that, that lodge its own economic independence, and there are other reasons for the, that of the other lodges. In these both urban and rural areas, the natural sciences were studied alongside the religious sciences, a distinction that, as we'll come to see in a moment, may not even have been accepted by scholars such as al -Yusi. In that rural presence of these lodges also shows us that books, which are often associated with, with urban centers of learning, were also present um, throughout uh, Morocco in urban and rural areas. One of the highlights of the research I did for the book was the ability to, um, with the uh, assistance of uh, Dr. Hamid Lahmar, of getting access to the uh, Hamsiya Ayashia Lodge in the High Atlas and being able to visit and see how they keep, keep their um, manuscripts there still, which have not yet been kind of moved into the new official building, at least when I visited a number of years ago. And so this sheer presence of thousands of manuscripts in rural areas also is goes some way, I think, alongside the scholarship of people such as Ismail Warshid on Tuat in southern Algeria to showing us how rural areas during the early modern period in Morocco were their own independent centers and did not, um, and you could really get a full education in the uh, religious and natural sciences outside of the classic centers of learning in Fez and Marrakesh and elsewhere. So that just briefly then to remind all of those of you, which seems strange in this situation, I have to say, who haven't looked at these areas of Morocco recently, but I'm sure you're all quite familiar with them. So if you look at the rural centers, as I'm talking about, we have the Tamgrut, Zawiya, um, or the Nasiriya Zawiya and Tamgrut. Here's Dile, which no longer exists. There's the Ilir Zawiya and the Atay Atlas that I will not be talking much about today. The Hamsi Ayashia Lodge and the High Atlas, which still exists as kind of an offshoot of the Dile Zawiya or Lodge. Um, and also is related to, of course, the um, Al Ayashi family, whom I will come to, the famous traveler of the 17th century who travels 
um, uh, whose two-volume um, or multi-volume um, account of his trips to on Hajj uh, I will come to later in my presentation. These then these centers need to be set alongside the classic urban centers of Fez, Marrakesh, and Tarudand, which was called Muhammadiya um, in the 16th and 17th century. All right. So. Before I proceed further, I, I want to say a brief comment on something that I found also striking. If you look back here to, to this centers here, you're, you're going to be looking at the rural and the urban. And we know that there's a false paradigm that was coming from the period of French colonialism in which they kind of divide Morocco into a Arab urban and a Amazigh rural areas. Um, one of the things that I found very striking about working on Alusi's discourses was his own um, thinking through of his own ethnic identity of the fact that he was almost there. And so why this has no direct bearing perhaps on the subject of today, it's a passage which I find striking, right? This is the only passage in the discourses uh, Al-Muhadarat that I've yet found where he talks about the fact that he is of course from the Eid Yusi, right? That he's, he's from an almost tribe. Um, and he's talking about genealogy, the science of genealogy of Nasr. And he says, you know, evidently remembering one's genealogy is not restricted to the Arabs. Um, before I mingled among my country folk, I used to think that the Arabs were the only ones who cared for it. I would say, the Amazigh are like goats. And the word in Arabic he uses here for Amazigh is Ajim. There is no bond between mother and son other than as being looked after and then going his own way. As for the father, no one ever asks about him. It's a strange moment because then he goes and he says, when I asked my country folk about this, I found the matter to be different from what I understood. I discovered that they remembered their lineage as I have described previously with genealogists ascertaining the branches and groups in the fashion of the Arabs. It suggests to me at least that in the case of al yusi and perhaps in the case of other Amazigh scholars that they had become so Arabized in their learning and in um, just focusing on Arabic and the Arabic learning of the Islamic world that they had in many ways uh, lost their own connection to their own ethnicity. At least, I don't know how else to interpret this. And I would love in the Q&A if anybody else can give me an interpretation of this passage. But it gives us a sense, of course, of the ethnic diversity of Morocco during this period. So if you're going to talk about the natural sciences, there's a couple of ways to go about doing it. And one of the ways I, I do, I, I think that it's productive, is to look at normative categorizations, of which there are quite a few. This, this, the idea of categorizing or ihsa'ilulum, of enumerating the sciences, has a long tradition in the Muslim world, of course, going back almost a, a thousand years before the 17th century, at least, you know, back to the, the third century Hijri, ninth century Maledi. And in here, when, in the 17th century, we have perhaps the, the most systematic and eloquent uh, categorization as done by Al-Yusi himself in his Al-Qanun. But there are other scholars, such as the polymath Abdurrahman al-Fazi, who writes the Uqnum, uh, the title page of which you have here. And it doesn't stop there. And subsequent in the 18th century, we find Al-Turan Bati in his Bulugh Aqsa al-Muram. He cribs a great deal from Al-Yusi. And he continues this process. So what do we find uh, when we get to this? Uh, there's a whole classification of different kinds of sciences. But what I'm really interested in here is focusing on, on one passage in al Yusi's book, al Qanun, which gives us the title for my lecture today. And that has to do with the, the notion of the revealed sciences. Now, a traditional breakdown in Islamic thought of the sciences often went along lines of a a contrast of al-ulum al-aqliya and the al-ulum al-naqliya. That is to say, the, the sciences which are seen as religious and as um, integral to Islam, and the sciences which are seen as rational and therefore sometimes also called al-ulum al-awail, the sciences coming from earlier um, uh, earlier civilizations in, uh, such as in, in, in the Greek and from Syriac and other languages and, and that were translated uh, beginning in these uh, eighth and ninth centuries. Alusi explodes this whole binary, and he does so in the following passage, or in, in part of the following passage. I'm, a, I'm afraid I should have actually just placed the Arabic because my English translation is a, a little um, awkward in some ways. But Alusi's basic point, and I'll leave this here for people to read if they want, but is that, look, if we call what is a shara'i, a science that is shara'i, or that is legally permissible, or revealed, right? This is, um, if we call that uh, those sciences that are revealed in the Quran, um, 
we end up with very little. There are very few scientists which are actually in the Quran. In fact, even jurisprudence, fiqh, is not found in the Quran outside of the particular ritual questions that have to do with prayer and with fasting and so forth. But the edifice of fiqh and nusul al-fiqh, that is all derived logically um, from the from the Quran and from the Hadith and so forth. And so it's a process that is something that is created afterwards, right? And he says the similar is when we look at the natural sciences, we find that these may not be mentioned in the Quran, although he goes on to list certain so, um, ayahs that, that contain mention of them. But because they, like the religious sciences, benefit the Muslim community, they too should be considered revealed. Right? So the alumas, if you say in Arabic, would be the alumas shara'iyah, are not really the what people consider the religious sciences, actually like the study of hadith, tafsir, and so forth, and fiqh, and kalam, and so forth. No. The religious sciences, the revealed sciences, are the ones that benefit the Muslim community. If there's a general injunction that you should treat people's sicknesses, then everything that follows after that, the entire discipline of medicine, is in fact shara'i. So Al-Yusi's description of this is quite, uh, in some ways, quite radical. This is kind of an instrumentalist of defining of what, what, is, um, what knowledge can be known and should be known. But also important here is to point out that Al-Tarambati, uh, uh, a hundred years later, cites this very passage and passages like it, in which Al-Yusi is actually refuting the uh, thought of Al-Suyuti, the 15th, 16th century Egyptian polymath. So that's one, we can look at those normative forms of dividing the sciences. Another place, of course, to see is, well, what did people actually study? And here you can go to the tabaqat literature, and I've given you here is Al-Qadri's Nashr al-Mathani, al karan al-Hadi, Ashr al-Wathani. And there's, we have numerous other, other uh, tabaqat works, both universal and local within Morocco in this time period. And by going through all of those, I was able to find that on average, we find about 8 to 10 percent of the scholars at this time um, studied one or more of the mathematical or natural sciences. So it's, it's a minority. It's a distinct minority, but it's present throughout. And there's never any sense that this is something unusual. We get, of course, much more fine-grained detail when we go to the Faharis or when we go to the Fahras of al yusi in this case. But we have over 120, I believe, extant copies of different kinds of Faharis, or maybe 120, and I think maybe 90 of them are extant from this time period, although very few of them are actually printed. I look at about 10 of them in, my, in the book to get a sense. And we find here as well that the natural sciences are taught right alongside the religious sciences. And also the Fahrasa genre during this time period in Morocco takes on a different tone entirely. It's no longer simply a listing of one's teachers and one's students, but it becomes a place in which you can bring in a, a full set of anecdotes, of intellectual anecdotes about from your learning. So for example, Al-Tamanarti, who's a very interesting scholar from the, the Sous, from the south of Morocco, he and who never leaves the south in fact he's able to become an established respected scholar without not only without ever having left uh, morocco but hardly i think the furthest north he ever travels is marrakesh and so he in, in his fahrasa which is a large work of some 400 pages in the printed edition he tells us here about this uh Bouakili, a prominent prominent 16th century scholar who was able to um create a sundial in tarundant um which was essentially targeted to the precise latitude and longitude of that city and would, by which one could tell various times of, of prayer, right? It, and uh, so this gives us one sense again of how the um, just biographical anecdotes about how the natural sciences are included. Um, you also find in Mariti has this amazing Fahrasa, it's three volumes in the, the printed, some 700, 800 pages. And he has, is, is what he calls uh, all these beneficial anecdotes that he gives, some of them about medicine. And I've given you two here that are specifically related to lettrism or the, the um, what we might call the science of invoking specific letters and words in order to activate the occult powers um, in, in objects and to bring um, 
or as we will see soon to uh, this of course this is seen by Meriti as a permissible as completely as a, a shara'i science because it is done with the proper intention um, and it is done usually through invocation of various aspects of the Quran this is distinct from magic as such and I will come to talk about that in, in a second in a later fahrasa uh, from the 18th century Umayri uh, gives us an incredible depiction of how to interpret omens and he gives a, a kind of a graph by uh, determining what day of the month it is and what omen you hear for example the barking of a dog you would move your finger alongside the grid he gives and you would find the specific meaning of this omen on that specific day right so this is yet another another kind of uh, almost astrological uh, form of knowledge which is placed within his his fahrasa. So I've given you two. You can look at how the natural sciences, how they are present at that time in terms of normative categorizations. We can look at how they are part and parcel of the educational trajectories of various scholars. Then we can look at how they are employed in legal discourses and Islamic jurisprudence. Now, in the Western Academy, there's been a lot of hand wringing in the in the past generation or so about um, early Orientalist attempts to equate Islam with the practice of law. And in the process, there has been, it was a, a marginalization, both of discussions of theology, but also of discussions of Sufism and discussion of other forms of piety in Western scholarship on the Muslim world. And I don't mean here, therefore, I say this as a, as a, as a cautionary moment, to bring in discussion of law as a the definitive discourse for uh, Muslim societies in Morocco and specifically Morocco in the 17th century. Nonetheless, with these legal sources that we have, we have amazing insights into the social history of the time that we would not otherwise have. And what we find there is that in Islamic, uh, the fatawa of written by scholars and read by scholars collected them, for example, in uh, one Sharisi's Me'yar, which of course is composed at the beginning of the 16th century, but also the later um, uh, of, of Al-Wazani, which is composed in the 20th century, we have almost a thousand years worth of different legal decisions that we can look back to and we can try to see how the natural sciences are invoked, right? And generally speaking, we find that when they are invoked, legal scholars try to appropriate their authority in making their own legal decisions. So they're seen as important for the practice of law in jurisprudence. And now in Morocco, and this is the precise the one example I want to give, in the 17th century, there is one particular legal issue which attracts a great amount of attention and a large amount of writing. And that is the issue, what uh, was sometimes called the great tobacco debate. And this has to do with the introduction of tobacco into Morocco in the late 16th century from Timbuktu, actually, from, through West Africa, one of those um, that resulted from the connection of West and North Africa that I talked about after Ahmed Mansour's conquest of Timbuktu. And it sets off a virulent debate between legal, legal scholars. Uh, Ahmed Mansour tries to have it banned, but then he passes away. And then we find prominent other scholars, uh, Ibn Abi Mahalli, actually, the, the rebel who, uh, and, and messianic figure who briefly takes uh, Marrakesh in 16. 13 before being defeated and killed uh, before he disgraced himself in the eyes of most scholars by but with through those actions he actually wrote a long sort of defense of smoking and we find other examples I'm sorry such as with here with Abu uh, Abdullah al Fezi and uh, in which he defended smoking and my point here is if you look through this there was a long discussion um, in the legal discourse about what effect smoking actually had is this a musker? Is it an intoxicant, right? Is it a, a, a mufsid? Is it actually a narcotic? Is it a murkid? Does it, does it basically a, a create anesthesia? How does it affect the body? How are we supposed to consider it? Is it uh, in that sense? Um, this is ultimately a medical, this is a question of natural science. It's a medical question. And in doing so, and in, in writing their copious fatawa, and we find also another de defense of smoking, for example, in the work of Ahmed Baba Timbukti, the, the, the scholar of Timbuktu who's held in house arrest in Marrakesh from 1591 to roughly 1607, a long defense um, of, of, of smoking um, as it being licit because it is not clearly illicit and it because it does not necessarily harm anyone, right? And 
this is another example of a scholar here. So it, the, the debate rages and it continues for some time and a good scholarship has been written on this by a number of people. But what I'm chiefly interested here is in using it as, as a, an example of the extent to which the natural sciences were not only integrated into the religious sciences, um, but were seen as necessary for their practice in order to be able to ascertain questions. And if you go back to Alusi's definition of, of every science being shara'i or legally permitted or revealed that benefits the Muslim community, of course, all these distinctions between religious and natural sciences disappear. The fourth way in which we can look at the sciences is by looking at what was written. And so here you have three different examples. One on the left is an alchemical work by Aneriti. The one in the middle is a, a table from Azij by al Rudani, a student of al Meriti, who goes on to achieve um, a fair amount of renown after he travels to the east and settles near um, Medina um, for his work on uh, astrolabes. And the third here is, uh, again, a salahi al dara'i. Uh, it's his commentary on a poem that he wrote. He wrote a, a thousand-lined poem, al hadiyya al maqbula And then he wrote uh, on medicine. And then he wrote a, a roughly 400-page manuscript cup in, in this copy that's in the, the National Library in Rabat uh, on a commentary on, on the very same poem. And so, and I said, as I said before, we have roughly 125 uh, works that are extant, but I don't know how many actually that were written, of course, that are lost, but 125 works that are extant in various um, Moroccan libraries in the natural sciences from this time period. This is, uh, I think, actually just a really just phenomenal moment. So this is an actual, actual astrolabe that, and we get a description of it from Alayashi who shows up, who, who visits al Rudani. And if you remember al Rudani again, he, um, I should say here. So the middle, the, the Zij here by Al-Rudani, this copy, the, pic, the picture I've taken from here, is today preserved in the uh, Hamsi Ayashiya Zawi on the High Atlas. And it is by far the, the fullest version of this manuscript that I've found. There is a copy, I think, at the University of, in the Hati Trust, uh, that now I think at University of Michigan. But it is not, the last 30 pages are missing. So this is this manuscript is then kept in its full version, this Zij or their, um, a listing of the geographic coordinates of different places in the world. Um, that's what this is, but also many other considerations about the rising and the falling of uh, the setting of the stars and of, of the houses, of the uh, astrological houses and so forth. The same fellow ended up making, as we see here in this description of Ayashi, uh, these astrolabes, which he then sold um, in order to, to make a living when he was in, in Medina. And uh, I actually has a very eloquent description of it, but you're looking at it here, so I don't need to read it necessarily. What's striking about this one, as you can see here, is it was sold in 2015 for a large amount of money, uh, some 722,000 British pounds, and it's signed by Al-Rudani uh, himself. Um, so these objects were obviously produced, and then they, they, they continued to be seen as valuable, which is seen in the, the fact that it is made its way down to us today. From Almeriti's work on alchemy, you get here uh, two passages, which I won't read to you necessarily, but alchemy, of course, has a rhetorical trope of always being a highly secretive art. And we see here and from his first book on alchemy that I have the top passage here, how he goes through. And um, this is kind of a common trope, but he says, I've discovered this. It's been very hard to learn about alchemy, but now I am going to pass on what I've learned to you. In his poem on alchemy, he goes through and, and explains many of the alchemical terms and words that are used to keep this knowledge from the uninitiated. And this, in this particular example, it has to do with the poem and when it says to, to feed your eagle, the, um, the eagle is actually a, a ammonia. And when you use, so you're using a lot of figurative language to describe actual alchemical experiments, right? And, and, and uh, Amariti lays this all out. And remember, he's writing these things and talking about them when he's largely sitting in places like Dilet in the Middle Atlas in a rural Sufi lodge. I briefly want to talk here about a uh, UC's definition of magic. And that's because magic is kind of the scene as the moment. It's the natural science. So we're talking about Seher here, but it is a forbidden science by and large, right? Because the difference, of course, between letterism and magic 
as two different ways, and I have an article, a forthcoming article precisely on the treatise I will come to talk about in a moment, is who you invoke. It's a question of intentionality. So while UC first gives an overview and describes what magic is like, was like for the Greeks, for the Babylonians, and goes through a variety of different types of magic, and then comes to describe the type of magic that is practiced in his own time. And you, say, you see here that it is, he connects what is practiced by the, the Jews, the Copts, and the Arabs, and he says, this is you're trying to invoke a presence, right? So you claim you're trying to get to the influences that come from the jinn, and with the power of magic, you're trying to employ, empower angels over the jinn. And this makes them subservient, and then you can use them uh, to do things for you. This would be actually a kind of, uh, one, one could see how if you're invoking angels and not jinn themselves, this might actually not be uh, completely reprehensible. And Alusi actually says that even though there are good prophetic statements to the fact that one should kill a sorcerer uh, and so forth. Um, that one much, it is worthwhile studying magic precisely so that one can recognize it when one sees it. Now, and Meriti, his Alusi's teacher in the natural sciences, actually went much further than this and wrote a long treatise against sorcery, in which, however, he uses a lot of occult methods to counter sorcery or magic, right? And so he, one of the passages, and I've taken this from three different manuscripts. The manuscript on the left is found online in the contemporary, uh, this is the, the modern looking one on the left, uh, Moroccan chat room regarding the occult. The middle one is from a manuscript which is kept in Tetuan. And the third one on the far right is from a, is from Segu actually in Mali, but it's currently in the collection uh, digitized by the Bayonet in, in Paris. And the, the example here that Mariti gives is if you're going to set out and you're going to try to find out if someone is uh, under the influence of magic, you should write this shape here, which is actually, of course, a, a, a magical square, on a white shape of paper and place it on your head when you face the Qibla with no female or slave being present. There's always a very interesting sort of use of gender in many of his, um, his anecdotes of this type. And you should then this is be able, use this to be able to find out if the worshiper is in fact uh, going to be under the influence of magic, right? And and what I like about this is he goes on to say if you can't actually write this between his eyes, um, as it says here to do, it's also permissible to write it on a piece of paper and hold it up. One can imagine somebody who is under the influence of sorcery might be uh, resist having you write this shape between his eyes. So what I've tried to do now in the second part is to give you a bit of a sense, a tangible sense, a material sense of the types of texts that are produced, the types of practices that go along with them. And now in the last part, um, I'd like to, to kind of give you some of the master narratives that go along and how we should consider this period that as, as um, uh, Fawad told us at the beginning is often referred to as one of decline or in his thought. And there are just to, give you some of these these master narratives of what we have been telling about this period in a little bit more detail. So we have outside of the study of um, Islam, people who write books like Toby Huff called The Rise of Early Modern Science, which exemplifies a certain strand of Eurocentric thinking in which the emergence of a certain kind of knowledge about the natural world from the 16th, 17th century onwards in Europe sets it off on a trajectory which is different from the Muslim world and China. And that happens because people in Europe are curious about the natural world and people in the Muslim world in China are not. That sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. So that's the kind of a good representative of what we might call a Eurocentric and a triumphalist sort of Western narrative. There is a counter narrative to that, that that comes up in for the traveling series, A Thousand and One Inventions, um, which is a run by a British NGO and was founded and has found widespread success. It's come through Abu Dhabi a couple of times since I've been here in different versions. And its essential argument is that all of modern science actually originated in the Muslim world and that therefore Muslims today can look at all of it as essentially their own civilization coming back to them, right? So this is almost equally destructive to an understanding of intellectual history as the first narrative, which sets off all intellectual uh, productivity in the West. And this one simply sets it in the Muslim world. And both of these narratives function to um, 
support the idea of a period of decline. A thousand and one inventions has no interest in what happens intellectually in the Muslim world following, as Fawaz pointed out, the sacking of Baghdad. Right? Now, this notion that the Muslim world entered into a decline, where does it come from? A short answer here would be to say that it seems to come up most clearly in the 19th century during the period of um, Islamic reform. Here you have Muhammad Abdu standing in for kind of a, a whole uh, different genealogy or a set of genealogies of Muslim reformers in the 19th century who are striking back against European colonialism and who are also trying to um, argue against the writings of such European scholars such as Ernest Renan, who said that religion and, and science are in, inherently inimical to each other, and that, you know, in his famous exchange with Jamal al-Din al-Fafrani, found that Islam was particularly um, at odds with, uh, with rationality. And, of course, Afghani pushed back and said, no, that's not true of Islam. Abdu uh, studied with Afghani and argued, you know, to get back to the real Islam, this is what is one genealogy seen kind of here is going back to the, the Salafi beginnings. We need to leapfrog over the decline period back to when was the golden age in order to revivify the Muslim world and resist colonialism. Strikingly, Orientalists such as Ignaz Goldseer, who were in, in Egypt at roughly at the same time that Abdu was beginning to formulate some of these thoughts, uh, picked up on what he saw as a narrative of decline, of intellectual decline regarding the natural sciences in the Muslim world due to a period of dark orthodoxy or finstalin orthodoxy. And, uh, and so we see here that this notion of decline is not merely an Orientalist mapping on of European triumphalism onto the Islamic world, but also emerged out of a period of Islamic reform in which they found a justification for reform precisely in the notion that there, there had not been any kind of rational thought in the Muslim world for centuries that they could draw upon. And so they leapfrog back to a much earlier period. These narratives um, reinforce each other and discourage us from looking into what happened during this period, which of course is highly ironic when you consider that the Muslim world itself was organized into three massive empires and the Ottoman, the Safavid and the Mughal empires, all of which were extraordinarily rich, politically powerful, militarily defeated Western powers at various points in time. And that, however, is somehow has gone along um, with this notion of intellectual decline. The third figure here on the right is Andrew Dixon White, who actually was co-founder of a university in America called Cornell, but more relevantly here, he argued for the inherent conflict between science and religion, and he did this from a perspective largely as a Protestant crit criticizing the influence of Catholicism in European history. But here again, we get the sense that religion holds science back. And that then is also was drawn on, um, as you can see the parallels here with the discussions that happened with, with that Abdu and Goldseer were involved in, the notion that religion could hold science back, that these were somehow oppositional forces. And, and White's work had a, had a strong effect in the, the Western Academy in thinking about the relationship between the natural sciences and religion in the 20th century. And as we saw in al yusis description of what sciences were actually revealed, there is in many ways a solution or a pa brushing past some of the binaries that were set up by the great thinkers of the 19th and early 20th centuries in this regard. So where are these kinds of theses that emerged out of, of these, the work of these, these thinkers can be summarized largely in the following ways. There's kind of the marginalization thesis, which said that the natural sciences were marginal to Islamic uh, civilization. This was later critiqued in a whole series of arg articles by Abdel Hamid Sabra in the 1980s, in which he said, no, no, actually the natural sciences quote unquote declined in the Muslim world because they were appropriated into Islamic civilization and naturalized to serve ritual purposes such as with prayer or with the uh, determining the direction of, um, not just well the direction of prayer, but also the times of prayer and uh, the times of the beginning and ending of Ramadan and so forth. And that's why they became instrumentalized and that's why they declined. Ahmed Dalal in a more recent book has argued that, that is, that's not sufficient, but that actually they were compartmentalized. He uses the work of Al-Biruni and Ibn Sina and argues that with these oh, figures, we can see how they acknowledged that uh, the religious and the natural sciences had different uh, realms of authority 
and that it's precisely because the religious sciences, the natural sciences were not giving authority over the religious sciences that they did not develop fully in the Muslim world in the same way that they did in Europe. And I'm not happy with any of these theses, and that's part of what this book tries to do, is to point out that all of these theses are variations on the Inhitat one. They all are predicated on the notion that there was decline, right? Because from today's perspective, decline seems like it is natural. That's the only thing that would explain why, for example, in Morocco we don't have a, a Newton or a Galileo, because our understanding of what science is and what scientific progress is is a natural teleology that is tied to events which take place in Europe, specifically in the 16th and 17th centuries. The situation is now different. As for what suggested at the beginning, we have the type of work such as the amazing uh, book by Khaled al ruwayheb here on the left, where he has set out a, a, a relatively um, has given the rest of us a paradigm to follow, if you so will. That is to say, he's shown us how the Muslim world in the 17th century was incredibly uh, dynamic, intellectually speaking. He does not deal with the natural sciences in this book, focuses chiefly, um, but not only, on, on logic and theology, to some extent also on Sufism, but gives us shows us how the marginal areas, that is to say, including Morocco, Kurdistan, and India, bring new intellectual life into the central Arab and, and Turkish-speaking lands during that period. Then we have the work of Sonia Brentias, who has shown us in, in her the last few decades of her work to what extent the natural sciences were actually institutionalized and taught and present in, in all aspects of, of Islamic societies during the precise period we're talking about here. And finally, a third trend that I've drawn upon here is the reintroduction of the occult sciences into our understanding of the natural sciences. There's Scholars of the Middle East have long been under an imperative to try to find in the history of sciences in the Muslim world precisely those sciences that can be shown to have influenced the natural sciences in Europe. And they have been shown, been shown precisely also have tried to, in, in the process, to downplay the role of the occult sciences in, in the Muslim world because those are seen as pseudosciences or sciences that are not uh, do not play a role in the broader history of science writ large in Europe. In the work of Matt Melvin Kushki, who I, I give a poster here from one of his lectures on the right, has done wonders in kind of dispelling that and of showing us the importance of understanding the natural sciences in the Muslim world is also including the occult and, uh, and seeing that it's actually one example of their dynamism. So what I've tried to do here is to show you a few things. As, 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 as people who are interested in Morocco, perhaps a lot of what I have to say here is of interest, uh, I would hope, because of its local history nature, the fact that it's telling us about the history of Morocco. But there's a broader point and a broader story to be told here, which is that it's precisely through these kinds of local histories that we can begin to interrogate these larger narratives, such as the narrative of Inhithat, of decline. Right. So even though this doesn't look like progress, what is occurring with the natural sciences here, if we measure it by our understanding of what modern science is today, it demonstrates a dynamism and an activity of Islamic and Muslim and sort of scholarship and specifically of Moroccan scholarship, specifically in areas that we don't associate with scholarship today, that's to say rural centers that we would otherwise miss and that we would not see. Of course, it also goes against the broader narrative that the Europeans are the ones who bring rationality back. This is what, again, flawed with his reference here to Napoleon's conquest in 1798, gave that, uh, you know, made that point well in his introduction that that is a faulty narrative, which gives us the sense that the Muslim world was kind of waiting to be colonized for the uh, for rationality to return to it. And of course, when we look at the types of texts that I've shown here and the prevalence in an institutionalized form of the natural sciences in Morocco, in rural, in urban areas, then these types of narratives fall apart. And precisely al yusis definition of all sciences that benefit the Muslim community as being revealed sciences or shara'i also allows us to step past some of the, our modern, and I use the word modern here deliberately, conceptions that uh, natural sciences have to be secularized before they become quote unquote real science and allows us to experience all of this in a different paradigm, right? And this is where I'm 
For those of you not familiar with Thomas Kuhn's work and his sort of, this is a very famous uh, American philosopher of science from the 1950s, he uses at the end of his book an image which is actually taken from Darwin of a tree of life and says that the science uh, develops not in a singular curve moving towards a truth but ultimately diverges in a rhizomic fashion, if you so will, um, like branches of a tree. And that what those branches are pointing towards, none of them are absolutely more true than any other, um, any other branch, but each one of them is coming into being in response to its local contextual needs in order to serve the needs of the people in that particular context. And that I think gives us a way of understanding how the sciences in Morocco in the 17th century could look so different from perhaps what we might imagine quote unquote real science to be like today and yet represent such a deep social investment and intellectual creativity in engaging with the natural world. And uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and thank you for your patience. What I think you're muted. I think you're still muted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, brilliant and illuminative uh, conference, which I consider uh, an invitation. I mean, or a call for uh, scholars, young scholars, to dig. I mean to I mean to to go to the to the to the libraries the manuscripts. I mean if they want to reconsider this uh, uh, period of uh, a decline. I mean which uh, mostly constructed in uh, Asra uh, Al Nahda. I mean thank you very much. I really liked your your talk. Now I mean I'm I'm happy to I mean to open the floor for our colleagues in France. I mean, uh, for comments or questions. I mean, uh, feel free. Uh, I mean, I don't know, Caitlin can. Caitlin, sure. if you want. Well, you can just, add it. Yeah. I mean, I'm mostly looking forward to hearing other people's questions, but Justin, thank you so much for the talk. And it's very exciting to hear you give an overview of the work as a whole, having followed this a little bit along the way. So congratulations also on the book. Um, I wonder, I just as, as as one question, and you know, always these questions are maybe a little unfair because they're falling outside the parameters of what you've done. But um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about choosing the 17th century. And um, you, you, I think very wisely advise us to stay away from notions of progress or advancements, but I'm wondering if you have any sense of shifts or changes over time. Um, do certain sciences become more prominent at certain moments? Do you have a sense of why that might be? Um, and so what do we see looking, do you have an, a sense of what we see looking specifically at the 17th century? And even from an intellectual history perspective, what might be going on before and after that? Right. Well, that's a great question, and one of the one of the benefits, of course, of, of advocating in the talk that for the the virtues of local histories, uh, is that you can say that hey, well, I can't speak to that because we need other people to write the local histories and uh, that come before and after. But as you know, in Khaled's book, to be less facetious, he kind of pinpoints a beginning and an end in many ways. I mean, for him specifically with Morocco, the intellectual history or the development of logic and theology kind of dies down at the beginning of the 18th century in many ways it, it uh, following Moulay Ismail's reign and the descent of Morocco into a form of political uh, chaos for roughly the next half century. I don't see that with the natural sciences necessarily. I will point out just to stress again that there we should never presume any kind of direct link between political stability and intellectual production. This is true for European intellectual history of course. I mean we have people like Hooke and, and Newton uh, coming up with their own ideas why London burns and the plague ravages everything and the king is getting his head cut off and all sorts of stuff is happening in England. It's not political stability, whatever you want to call it. And they nevertheless can come to insights. In Morocco, on the other hand, uh, you see 
is being born as Mule, uh, you know, in the aftermath of Mule Zedan's death, the Sayadi dynasty is completely disintegrated. You have four or five warring parties. The Europeans are trying to colonize the coast with Portuguese. Moroccans are going on jihad. You have a, a, a pirate republic in Saleh. I mean, Morocco, a lot of fun stuff is going on in Morocco, but politically it's a total chaotic. And yet we have this massive intellectual production in these rural and urban centers at this time period. So to get back to your question, I do think, and I buy here into or rest on or stand on the shoulders of Muhammad Haji and others, that the Saidis are able to set up again an intellectual institutional structure in the cities and to help fund and get on their feet intellectual centers in rural areas that then are able to persist following the, 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 the dissolution of the Saidi dynasty. And that that gives us a beginning, a kind of, if we do look at sort of the, if, I mean, I'm not going to go back too far here into sort of, but the Marinids by the end of the 15th century, we do seem to see, I don't know, some form of destabilization. Although as soon as I say that, I'm like, but wait a second, what about Al-Jazuli and what about the new orders that are arising physically at that time? So maybe I don't want to make that argument. But then when we go into the 18th century, what I do see is that the, it, from the point of view of the natural sciences, unlike what Khaled is talking about, they just continue. That is to say, there is no... So what I think what we're really talking about here is the persistent effects of later 19th and 20th differentiations between science and pseudoscience. And then so that much of the interest in the occult, for example, simply gets written off as not worthwhile intellectual production. Whereas I would perceive, see it precisely as these are not marginal figures who are investing in these sciences. These are central figures into the intellectual traditions of their day who are writing these works on, um, on various occult and other natural sciences. And so I think that just continues. I don't, I don't precisely know. I can't give you an end date. I'm assuming it's somewhere in the 19th century, but that's because I blame almost everything in the 19th century. Can I ask one more question, Fuad? Yeah, please, yes, go ahead. Okay, well, we'll see if I can articulate this. Um, I mean, I think part your study is so welcome in part because I think there's also a growing recognition um, among intellectual historians that are triumphalist narrative is problematic in so many ways, but especially when we look around and see the effects of climate change, for example. Um, so I I don't want to push you into necessarily passing judgment or, um, or looking for values, but I, I am curious in looking at these discourses of the natural sciences, how these Moroccan scholars see the place of the human in the broader natural world. Like, can you describe a little bit um, what that, I guess, aspect of their thought looks like? Does that, does the question make sense? I think it does, but I don't think I have a good answer. I mean, I guess my, my central answer would come back to uh, that, that um, the general way in which the scholars I read seem to think about the place of the human is a pretty traditional Abrahamic understanding of the role of the human as being a um, vice regent or khalifa or whatever of God on earth, right? So there is a there is a distinction here. In in in, in a Christian tradition, it would be uh, man has dominion over over the world, and so in that sense, you know, there have been, of course, been really strong, energetic, interesting. Um, theological efforts within the Muslim tradition in, in modern times to articulate a theology of in the environment and of how to find in Islamic sources a way of engaging in a way of, of, of seeing the human as part and parcel of the natural world. I don't find that kind of thinking prominent in the 17th and 18th centuries. What? Okay. I seem to, I don't, can't see you guys Just anymore. You. Here we are. Mm -hmm. back. Excellent. So, uh, thank you so much for this, I mean, for your answer. Uh, I mean, what do you think, Muqtad, uh, Yunus, mm -hmm. Said? do you have any question? What? Uh, hi, Said. Yeah. please. Hi, I would, I would like just, just to say hi uh, and, and thank uh, Dr. Stil uh, for this brilliant and interesting uh, uh, lecture. <laughs> uh, 
thanks also to Fuad uh, for uh, uh, making this this uh, opportunity for all of us to meet. Uh, we, although we, we live, uh, we are living together in Abu Dhabi, so uh, we didn't have the opportunity to, I know, to, it's, to meet. So it's uh, hopefully we can meet later to for more like, so, exchange uh, opportunities. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't have like, um, I would like to to know if, if you could please tell us, tell us your, your own story. Uh, how did you come to the, to the Maghrib, Maghribian studies, uh, especially to yeah. natural sciences and uh, Hassan Lucy uh, and others? Well, I, I don't want to bore you with too much of my life story in this regard, but uh, no, I ended up in Morocco. Like, it's more personal, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's personal, but it's no, it's it's quite straightforward in many ways. I mean, out of college, I, I wanted to learn Arabic. I didn't know Arabic, and so, yani fi am tasawat asin jito ila fez wa bidet yani dirasati fi fez wa taalimtu lugha arabia fi fez wa badin taqaltu yani fi dirasat shaq lausat wa Islam bi shaq alam wa ta bidayti yani fi fez. Um, and then it so far it continued after that, right? But my first book, Infectious Ideas, that Fouad set, set out was uh, a comparative study of responses to the Black Death looking in Iberia at Al-Andalus. And initially I was an historian of Al-Andalus. In a very late part of that dissertation research, I was sitting in Essesik back in the old days when Essesik was downtown in, in Madrid. And uh, Maribel Fierro walked in one day because she was being kind and I was a clueless graduate student. And she said, you know, you should really read what, what UC says about this. And I was like, who's UC? Why are you giving me this guy? And so I opened the Muhadarat and there is about a five page section on contagion. And it ends up being something that I wrote uh, about in my first book. And I was reading and I was like, wow, this guy's very interesting. This, does, this, is, this is unusual. I find his, his thinking is, is quite stimulating. And so when I began to think about my second book, I also began thinking about the fact how there was this overarching narrative in our study of the Muslim world of a opposition between religion and natural sciences. This had come up, and I apologize for going into detail here, but I, I use this as an opening anecdote in the book. Uh, one of the people, the Muslims, who responded uh, in a plague treatise in the 14th century to the Black Death was Ibn al-Khatib, Lisan al-Din Ibn al-Khatib, the famed uh, visitor of Granada. He wrote a treatise, and in it he talked about the transmissibility of the plague, and this is not actually not all that unusual. Many Muslim scholars talked about that, but he says specifically at one point, if uh, that there are prophetic hadith which say that it's not contagious and you need to interpret them in accordance with the, the, the evidence that we see. Okay. Now, this actually is not that unusual. There were, many Muslim, there were other Muslim scholars who said things like this, but Western scholarship saw this and they were like, aha, this is our man. He is a rationalist avant la lettre. We like him. In fact, he shows us why all these other Muslims were just conservative Orthodox people. And the fact that Al-Yusi ended up getting strangled in jail in Fez in 1374 means that he was killed because of his views on contagion. I kid you not, there are people who actually said this, which, which is actually wrong. I mean, none of that makes sense, but it showed to me that there's this underlying assumption in a fair bit of Western scholarship, but also in scholarship within the Middle East that speaking up about the rational sciences puts you in danger, in opposition to the religious sciences. This is a preconception, right? And, and this just, just doesn't, is not so. It just is wrong. And in part, what I then did in the second project was to try to explain how exactly, in one particular context, we can understand uh, the connection between these various types of learning. And then I, I, I found that Alusi was the perfect place to start, right? Because he, in his Al Qanun, sets out this. Uh... Anyway, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, I... uh, continuing to the, to, the, to the first question by my colleague, uh, Kathleen. So, why, why the previous period? Why, why not like the 50, 50? 15th century or 16th century, what does the significance, any, what significance does have these, like these two centuries? Uh, the same question, like, 
what 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 is the significance of the of the of the of the next next two centuries until Muhammad Abdu and the, uh, the the period of reformist and especially that you you have mentioned the, that the, uh, the reformists like Muhammad Abdu yeah. used this uh, like uh, the, the decline the decline of yes. uh, Islamic civilization as uh, I don't know uh, as a way to explain uh, their activity their their movements. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's easier. That it is like there was a gap between the seventh century and the the nineteenth and the twentieth century. So this are, I think, the same question as. I don't think I can asked. answer that. That is to say, I don't think I can actually tell you what happened in the eighteenth and the nineteenth centuries, um, in specifically, because I haven't actually looked. I haven't looked. I think the nineteen, the early nineteenth century would be a time that I would need to. There's a lot that needs to be understood that I don't know. What I can say is that in the 16th and the 17th century, we see that an infrastructure, an educational infrastructure comes into being that did not previously exist in Morocco. Mm -hmm. That is to say that these Zawaya are not, do not exist prior to the 16th century in any kind of, of way that they do subsequently to that. There are Zawiyas before then, but they're not on the stage. They're not institutionalized in the way. They don't have the economic support and they don't seem to become rural centers of, of book learning in the way that they, they do then. So it's through the establishment of this new kind of infrastructure that in part we see a uh, social forms that can also help to be resistant to forms of political decline. And so that I see during that time period something coming to being that did not exist previously. What happened subsequently, that is to say your question of that Caitlin was pushing me on too, on the 18th and 19th century, in part, I think it is that, of course, the type of learning that is being exemplified in these centers becomes increasingly socially marginalized. That is to say, so that when we look at the 18th and 19th centuries in Moroccan scholarship, specifically from the point of view of reformers of, in Morocco, like Alal al fezi from the 19th into the 20th century and backwards, most of the type of stuff that I'm talking about here is, as being interesting production is seen as irrelevant because it does not help you resist the French colonial presence. It's not that kind of learning. And this is helped along, as I try to point out in the book, by the fact that when the French reform the curriculum in the Qarawiyin in the 1920s, they kick out all the natural sciences. So when the Moroccan state comes back in and reopens the Qarawiyin in the 20th century and gets it running again, it's now running on a curriculum. This is not my work. This is Jeff Porter's work. But they're running it on a curriculum that actually gives the impression that the natural sciences were never part of it. And so that colonial and post-colonial sense reinforces our perception that the natural sciences were not part of the Moroccan religious landscape in the previous period and makes it easier to write them out, out of this history. So the, some thoughts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you Sayyid. So thank you, uh, uh, do you have something to say, Muqdad? Or, um... Go ahead, please. Tafaddal. Uh, okay. Ah, vas-y, cher ami, en français, vous pouvez parler en français. Est-ce في البلاد العربية عموما التي نجهلها هي هذه الفترة سواء في المغرب أو في بلدان أخرى يعني وأبقى في بلدان أخرى كيف تطورت هذه العلوم فقط أود أن أعود هل هناك نموذج واحد للانحطاط وللتقدم أنا مهتم كثيرا بابن خلدون لماذا أعود قليلا إلى الوراء لماذا ابن خلدون لأنه أرخى للعلو أظن يمكن نقول أنه إبستيمولوجيا وتاريخ للعلوم بقي أرخى للعلوم أرخى للمؤسسات أرخى للمشيخات 
الرخاء لطرق التعليم كيف انتقلت العلوم من هنا إلى هنا من الشرق إلى الغرب ثم كذلك ابتداء من الرازي من عرج الرازي الذي تحدثنا عنه المرة الفارغة الرخاء للطرق المختلفة بين المدارس الرخاء للإيمانويل أي أمهات المعتمدة في التعليم الرخاء لكن بقي نوعا ما أرسطيا نوعا ما بالنسبة إلى صفاء العلوم أظن هنا كيف يتكلم ابن خلدون بالنسبة للحيطات عنده فكرة عن الحيطات لكن عنده بربط العلوم بالحضارة بنمو الحضارة بقوة كذا لا لا أظن ما لا أرى من المفيد كثيرا أن نربط حتما خط العلوم أو اتجاه العلوم يجب أن يكون كما تطور في أوروبا ابن خلدون نفسه كان على وعي لماذا؟ خلدون هناك محوران في الأمر دوزاكس هناك في بالنسبة إلى تطور العلوم بالقياس إلى النمو الحضاري والاستقرار السياسي كان على وعي بما يحدث كان له صدى بما يحدث في في أوروبا يقول في بلاد الروم كان هناك وكان على وعي بما بالانحطاط في معناه هو السياسي والثقافي والعلمي في المغرب وكان على وعي كذلك بأنه بدأ يسمع عن نمو علمي في المشرق ويتحدث عن هؤلاء آه إذا ربما من, من الأحسن أن نراجع نراجع أن لا يجب حتما أن نبحث عن خط أحادي اتجاه أحادي تطورت العلوم بطريقة أخرى إذا عندما ربما في معنى الذي بدأت العلوم يهتم بها ابن خلدون وبدأت تطور في الغرب بمعنى وكيف أنها بدأت تنمو أسواقها زاخرة وما في المشرق ليس بنفس المعنى إذا ربما يمكن هنا بالاعتماد على ابن خلدون نؤرخ لهذا الانحطاط اللاحق لأنه يعني أرخه هو في الفترة التي عاشها التي عاشها انطلاقا من انطلاقا من الرأسي خاصة ولذلك ربما بالنسبة إلى الراسيوناليزم وما إليه قد قد يكون من المستحسن لا نقف عند ابن رشد وأن إياك أن نتقدم شيئا شيئا قليلا إلى ما بعد ابن رشد لأننا يعني نقول كل شيء وقف مع ابن رشد وانتهى فقط أردت أن أسأل من هذه الناحية فقط في رؤية نوعا ما منظورية بيرسبكتيف من ناحية أخرى أي الانحطاط أو التقدم بربطه بالظروف السياسية والظروف الحضارية والمعاقبة شكرا يعني شكرا يا أستاذ مكتوم ليس لي تعليق لا أعتقد على ذلك طبعا نستطيع أن نعترف أن كل شيء يرجع إلى ابن رشد <تصفيق> لا لا من المهم من المهم ان نبقى في هذه الفتره التي تحدثت عنها من المهم جدا وان نقوم بدراساتنا عديده حول هذه الفتره فيما بعد نعم ولكن نعم عندما نتكلم بجد علي ان اقول انا اعتقد ان لغايه الان نحن ندرس ونعرف كثيرا عن الظروف الثقافيه والحضاريه والسياسيه للوقت ابن رشد مثلا ولوقت ابن خلدون ولكن م. هذا السياق ال العلمي والاجتماعي ليس لنا يعني امكانيه ان نراها بنفس الوضوح عندما نتحدث عن القرن السادس عشر والسابع عشر وهذا طبعا الان مع شغل كيتلين مثلا وعن البحث الذي الذي يقوم به كثير من الباحثين مثلها وطبعا خالد نرى هذا أوضح من قبل ولكن في غاية الآن لا أعتقد أن عندنا يعني تاريخ علمي من وقت ابن رشد لغاية وقت اليوسي 
لا ارى انا ليس ال... عندي كثير من القطب يعني ورائي ولكن عن تاريخ المغرب ولكن لا ارى كتاب يعني بهذا هذا 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 شكل وهذا لسبب لاسباب مختلفه كثير من المصادر انا كنت استخدمها يعني بكتابه هذا الكتاب هي ما زالت في مخطوط وقراءتها و يعني الكتابة عنها ليس لنا نحتاج أكثر من الباحثين الذين يقومون بشغل يعني مع هذه المصادر وفقط يعني في الجيل السابق بدأ هذا الشغل أنا أعتقد لا نحن ما زلنا في بداية الأمر نعم <تصفيق> <laughs> so the, 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 I mean, the paradox, the paradoxical thing is that we built many assumptions concerning the, the Muslim world during this period, far from the manuscripts, far from the, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, relative documents that uh, the document that has to do with, with this period. So, uh, I mean, it seems that even Muslim scholars, I mean, from Al Nahda, Muhammad Abdu, Afghani, Rashid Rida, and others, are victims of these assumptions built in the 19th century, which yes. these, these assumptions themselves are are built on uh, a very very limited, I mean, uh, documents. Now it's it's our job to reconsider. I mean these things, and this is exactly I mean the the, the message of your of your book. I mean in the conclusion, uh, uh, I mean there are many many manuscripts that still waiting or are waiting. I mean to be edited and to I mean to be accessible to the to the large uh, scholars. So it's like that we should we should stop talking about something that we do not know. I mean, uh, I mean, True. Uh, that's not... Go ahead. I see. Yes. No, I want to hear what Caitlin has to say. Oh, well, yes. and I was going to add to that, you know, looking at the documents and also looking not only for your, you know, parallels to European history that yeah. the it's, it's the, the assumptions are, are worse, I think, than not looking at the documents. The assumptions are that it's not worthwhile to understand any history that does not look like European history, right? So we, we should look at the documents, um, but look at them for what they are and what we can learn about human history from that. Um, right, I mean, there's, yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, I think that the, the temptation, and I saw this explicitly with things like the Thousand and One Inventions exhibit is to be that one of the reasons we haven't been looking at the documents is we haven't found a Muslim scientific revolution when we do look at the documents. So why look at the documents, right? I mean, why look at the sources? Yeah, right, yeah. And it's only yeah. when we can start articulating what, what Caitlin just laid out, that is to say a rationale uh, for why these, these this intellectual history is important and relevant without Europe, right? Without the European trajectory that we can beginning to really dig into it. And that's why I, in my own limited fashion in this book, have tried to invoke this, this paradigm language of Thomas Kuhn and saying that with, there are ways to consider intellectual communities pursuing questions and interests that may not seem relevant to other communities that nevertheless play a very important role in the social circumstances that they are involved in. And that's why we can talk about, for example, the intellectual life of 17th century Mar Morocco being incredibly dynamic and productive without ever mapping on to a European understanding of a teleological narrative of, of progress, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I think we have to be able to do. But you're absolutely right. We still don't know what happened. We don't know the history of the, this thinking. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. I, mean, I have just I mean, a small, uh, I mean, a short question that I, I mean, if you allow me to add. Was this, I mean, was this assumption or this uh, paradigm of decline used by mainly by uh, the Ruad al-Nahda, Muhammad Abdu, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani and others. Was it just like uh, uh, an auto-justification? 
I mean, to justify, to justify, I mean, there, I don't know, I mean, the Nahda, so they were just obliged to, to talk about a darkness. There is golden age, I think darkness, this, I think Nahda. This, yeah, no, I think this is complicated. Yeah, in part, of course, if you are going to embark on a narrative of reform, it helps yeah. to point out that everybody right before you needs to be reformed, right? So yeah. that is a rhetorical stance that can be taken. But I, I refer you to, I mean, there's a, a book that I re, that I refer to in a somewhat biting fashion at the very end of my, my work, which is uh, Ahmed Shamsi's new book on 19th yeah. century Cairo, which is in fact, in many ways, a very, very good book. Um, but he lays out and explains this. I disagree with the book because he still talks about a narrative of decline and the kind of uh, obscurationist thought in the 70s in that book is articulate the world of the people who are printing in the Bulak editions and other editions, their understanding of what are the classics and the important works of Islamic thought in the early and mid 19th century. And that gives you a sense of how they're establishing a new canon. And in that process of establishing a new canon, they are also like writing out the whole say 14th to 18th century. And they're reaching back to what they see as the the original important works, right? And so that's where that comes from. It's, it's important to understand this is not just an external orientalist kind of power grab of telling people that they've been in decline. It's something, and there's a whole bunch of scholarship that I cite. This is not really my work. It's what I, I cite in the footnotes here that shows us how the, the European orientalists and the local reformers and, and, and intellectuals um, feed off each other and how their theories work together to establish this powerful narrative of decline, which then um, justifies for the beginning Salafi movement. It justifies yeah. all for, for, for this newness because they have to have, they have this negative conservative obscurationist, you know, group of ulama who don't have anything to do with them. But if we want to get rid of the colonial powers, we have to go back to the sources. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, it's, it's really powerful. I mean, Afghani actually calls for a Protestant reformation. He says we need a reformation just like the Protestants had one, yeah. you know, in that sense. Um, so it's, it's very powerful rhetoric. It does not do justice to the scholarship of the 17th and 18th and previous centuries. I agree. Thank you so much. Do you, do you have something to add, please? If you, if you want, I mean, just. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Um, uh, سأتحدث بالعربية ربما لي أكون أكثر راحة في إيصال الفكرة um, طبعا أشكر البروفيسور ستيرنز على هذه ال... هذا العرض المتميز وأبارك له أيضا على صدور الكتاب uh, سؤالي متعلق بما يهمني بالدرجة الأولى وإلا فإن العرض مليء جدا بالمسائل التي يمكن أن نناقشها أو نطرح بخصوصها أسئلة أيضا أستمتع بأسئلة المشاركين أو الحضور أو يعني أفضل أن أستمع للبروفيسور ستيرز أكثر لكن ما أثر انتباهي هو من الخلاصات الأولى التي قدمها في بداية العرض عندما قال أن المؤلفات الفلسفية كان لها دور مهم لكن لم يكن لها دور مركزي أريد أن أفهم هذه المسألة بشكل يعني لأنها دقيقة جدا وتلخص الوضع خصوصا فيما يتعلق بالمؤلفات الفلسفية لأن المؤلفات الفلسفية التي أقصدها هي البيور فلوسوفي يعني سواء ابن رشد أو حتى ابن سينا يعني المشائيين أو هذه المؤلفات لم يكن لها حضور في مغرب هذه الفترة في عصر اليوسي وعني أنا شخصيا لم أجد إلا شخصين فقط هما من أسرة الفاسي ربما عبد القادر عبد الرحمن ابن عبد القادر كان له مساهمات فلسفية وقرأ هناك دليل على أنه طلع على مؤلفات فلسفية لنصير الدين الطوسي وهذا من أغرب الأشياء وأيضا أحد أفراد هذه الأسرة هو أبو حفص عمر لكن اليوسي حتى اليوسي في القانون لا كلامه وإن كان انتصارا وعقلانيا هو عالم عقلاني ينتصر لي هذا الجانب لكنه لكن لا يوجد دليل على اطلاعه على كتب الفلاسفة بشكل مباشر ربما تلقى هذه الأفكار 
شفهيا لان الوضع كان قد استقر في المغرب على تحريم الفلسفه والاشتغال بها وحتى العلوم الطبيعيه التي تناولها البروفيسور ستيرز يعني سواء اليوسي او غيره يحاولون ايجاد مبررات دينيه لها حتى يدرسونها او يؤلفون فيها حتى العلوم المرفوضه هذه الحروفيه وغيرها هي ايضا اشياء يحاولون ايجاد مبررات دينيه للاشتغال بها لكن الفلسفه الامر استقر بعد الغزالي او عند طائفه الاشاعر الذين كان المغاربه متمسكين بها وربما اكثر من غيرهم حتى في المشرق وكيتلين تعرف الامر بخصوص الموقف السنوسي من الرازي مثلا و وقبله السكتاني ايضا نفس الامر مع الرازي عموما اضيف ايضا مساله الى الى جانب الزوايا مساله الاسر العلميه التي كانت موجوده في المغرب بشكل قوي جدا اكثر بالمقارنه مع المشرق هذا ايضا كان له مساهمات في ظهور هذه النهضة في هذه الفترة اللي هي عصر اليوسي إذا استطعنا أن نسميه بهذا الاسم إذا عندي ملاحظة متعلقة بالأسر العلمية الممتدة عبر القرون هذه مسألة ربما تفرد بها الغرب الإسلامي بعكس المشرق يعني نجد أسرة الفاسي مثلا بنو الجد من الأندلس إلى على الفاسي وربما بعده بقليل هم كلهم أسر تضم مئات ربما الاشخاص والافراد اسره الكتاني اسره بالحج حمدون بالحاج الى اخره يعني كثير كثيرون جدا آه هذه مسألة الاولى المتعلقه بالاسر المساله الثانيه هي مساله المؤلفات الفلسفيه والطلاع ان كان للبروفيسور ستيرنز اي معرفه بالطلاع علماء او اشتغالهم او وجود مخطوطات مثلا فلسفيه محفوظه هنا في مكتبات المغرب هذا ربما قد يلقي ضوءا على مساله التلقي اذا صح التعبير وشكرا جزيلا شكرا يعني الف شكر لهذه الافكار وهذه الملاحظات للاسف الشديد لا اعتقد وانا اعرف عن اي مخطوط يعني أو أن مجموعة من المخطوطات يعني الفلسفية بمعنى الفلسفة التي كنت تستخدمها أنت يعني في هذا هذه هي الملاحظات هناك مخطوطة واحدة أشار لها الدكتور بيرتولاتشي للشفاء إلهيات الشفاء محفوظة في مؤسسة علل الفاسي في الدار البيضاء نعم ربما تداولتها أسرة الفاسية يعني نعم طبعا انا لم لم اتكلم عن الفلسفه بهذا المعنى يعني بفلسفه عندما يوسي مثلا يتكلم عن العلوم الفلسفيه او ويفارق بينها يعني لا يهتم بهذا بفلسفه ابن رشد او بهذا بهذا النوع من الفلسفه انا اتكلم عن العلوم مختلفة يعني اللوم الطبيعية وصدق يعني أنا لا أعرف أنا عن 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 الفلسفة ما أن يعني في كتب الطبقات وجدت بعض الأماكن عندما شخص يعني عندما الكاتب يوسف يوسف شخص ثاني بأنه فلسوف أو أنه درس الفلسفة ولكن ما معنى ذلك بالضبط في هذا السياق غامض بالنسبه لنا لا اعرفه ولكن انا لا اعرف هذا بالنسبه لي ليس مهم جدا انا لا اهتم يعني ب بهذا النوع من من الفلسفه او ما هذا علم يعني في في هذا السياق لا ي... انا اهتم اكثر بكيف الحياه الالميه بشكل عام وبالنسبه للمغيتي واليوسي وكل هؤلاء أم كان عندهم حياة علمية غنية جدا مع أنهم لا يتكلمون عن فلسفة ابن رشد أو عن عن الغازي خصوصا إلى آخره أم لا أعرف لا يعتمد بالنسبة لي كنت كنت تستخدم مفهوم الفلسفة 
يعني بشكل ضيق جدا يعني بهذا وعلينا ان ان نفتح مفهوم الفلسفه يعني ابواب مفهوم الفلسفه الى يعني هي هي واسعه في رايي يعني اعقب بسرعه يا استاذ مختار ثم اسمح للاستاذ مختار تفضل يا انا استخدمت مصطلح الفلسفه بما يرتضيه العالم لنفسه يعني مم. هل اليوسي اذا قلت له انت فيلسوف هل يقبل ذلك ام لا لا اعتقد طيب هذا أنا هذا أنا هو كان استخدامي لكلمه فلسفه آه فهم فهم شكرا تفضل استاذ مقتاد ملاحظه وجيزه ملاحظه وجيزه فقط تفضل يعني هل ربما لا يجب ان نبحث عن الفلسفه انا لا اعرف هذه الفتره هل ترد هل ترد كلمه حكمه او شيء كهذا نعم لم تعد الفلسفه بقدر ما اصبحت لذلك يدرج هذه الامور الامور التي هي لي سيونس اوكولت وما اليه تدخل اذا اصبح مفهوم الفلسفه كثيرا يعوض بالحكمه فيها الالهيات فيها كذا وفيها كذلك الامور السحر والحروف وكذا هذه ربما هناك انزياح او نقل لشيء فشيء وتستعمل كلمه حكم حكمه لتغطي كل ذلك احيانا على اليوسي مثلا يتكلم كثيرا عن الحكمه حكمه مفهوم يعني بالمعنى, نعم. بالمعنى لم تعد الفلسفه بيور فلسفه يعني لل لثلاث العلوم العملية والعلوم النظرية كذا الكلاسيكية كحدود كذا ربما بمعاني أخرى تطورت وأدخلت فيها علوم أخرى وتستعمل حكمة ربما شكرا شكرا جزيلا thank you so much I mean I guess that we have to stop here I don't I didn't uh, I haven't received any uh, question from our I mean, I mean, uh, followers on Facebook. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for this interesting, uh, I mean, uh, talk and conversation. Uh, I am. Uh, I really uh, appreciate. I mean, uh, what you uh, said, uh, Justin, uh, and I. Uh, I'm not. I mean, through what you are doing i invite my um invite my student and my uh, phd student and my uh, master student to dig more in these manuscripts i mean i mean there are there is a field i mean unknown field to discover and to 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 study i mean uh, at least to make this period more known to the to the to the to the to the, to the rest of the world so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, our friends and colleagues. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Mokhlad, Jonas, and Saeed. I mean, uh, we have another, I mean, uh, the next conference, maybe, uh, I mean, uh, maybe, uh, maybe September, the end of, of the end of December, uh, Khaled Rwayhev will be, will be here to talk to us. I will be uh, pleased to, to introduce you and to invite you to join our, our conversation. Uh, so, can I see you? Bye bye and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for your time. Thank you, Yunus and Saeed and Mokhtar. Thank you. 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 Hello. Hi. I'm here. I'm here. لا أود أن أقول شكرا شكرا جزيلا وأسلم على